Yeah, that's fine. Okay. Well, hello, friends. God bless you for joining us. A special joy to welcome you to our uh, program and the ministry, precious ministry of God's Word this evening. Lovely to see you all, as I said, some from the south coast of England and some from the Midlands and the northwest, uh, the, where I live, the, the wet and soggy northwest. We've had a lot of rain, uh, but uh, anyway, it's a joy to see you and some a special joy to see friends here this evening as, a, as we saw you last week who have tuned in from Bonnie, Scotland. Hi, Scotland is Bonnie a week ago, and I think it gets bonnier every time I come. Anyway, praise the Lord. It's good to see you, and may God bless us as we join together in the Word of God. We're grateful to John, who uh, is in charge of the Libras here. He has his hands on the throttle, and we're very grateful to others who make sure that this uh, electronic... Uh, Communication can work, and the word of God can go forth. God bless you then for coming, and we'll come now to a very beautiful reading in the uh, book of Isaiah, the Old Testament prophet Isaiah, and chapter 61. And I'm going to read, and I invite you to follow carefully the beautiful messianic echoes and expressions which are in this beautiful messianic uh, passage. Christ is in all the scriptures, and he's in the book of Gen book of Genesis, indeed, the first verse of Genesis, and he's here in the book of Isaiah. So I want to read from Isaiah chapter 61 and from verse 1. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek, he has sent me to bind up the broken hearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound. These are all messianic projections of the coming, coming anointed Messiah of Israel, Yeshua HaMashiach, the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 2, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all who mourn, to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give unto them beauty for ashes. These are all beautiful expressions. The oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they may be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. And we break off the reading there in that uh, marvelous uh, 61st chapter of Isaiah. Now, friends, I like the preacher who said, I forget which one, God only had one son, and he became a preacher. And he did indeed. And I want to introduce you this evening to something wonderful about the Lord Jesus. And I want to read the fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy in Luke, please, chapter 14, commencing to read at verse 16. Here is the Lord Jesus, God's son, a preacher, and he goes to the synagogue where he was brought up as a boy. Let me read Luke chapter 4 verse, from verse 16. And he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, his habit, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah or Isaiah. When he opened the book, he found the place where it was written. And we have just read in chapter 61. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives and the recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And here, our Lord Jesus Christ 
interrupted the reading from Isaiah 61. Because in Isaiah 61, the prophecy continues, and the day of vengeance of our God. The Lord Jesus interrupted his reading of the passage. He was the original dispensationalist, and he understood that the day of vengeance of our God would be into the prophetic future, beyond his messianic mission to save the world. You remember he said, I have come not to condemn the world, that, that's in the future, but to save the world. So he says to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. He's quoting Isaiah. Here. And he closed the book, gave it back to the minister, and sat down. This is interesting. The eyes of all them that were in the synagogue were fastened upon him. I think there must have been something of great majesty in which the Lord Jesus read from Isaiah. The Bible says in the New Testament that he spake with authority and not as the scribes. And verse 21, at Luke chapter 4, he began to say unto them, This day is this scripture from Isaiah fulfilled in your ears. And all bear him witness and wondered at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. And they said, that is the crowd in the synagogue said, is not this Joseph's son? And he said unto them, ye will surely say unto me this proverb, physician, heal thyself. Whatsoever ye have heard done in Capernaum, do also here in thy country. When the Lord Jesus concluded his uh, his his reading from the synagogue scrolls in the pulpit. The people were amazed. It not, is not this Joseph's son. Well, we know this boy. He was brought up here. He's come to his home church. Uh, he, he's come to Nazareth, where he grew up as a boy. We know him. So how can the messianic prophecy be fulfilled as he has claimed? The Lord Jesus stood that day in the synagogue at Nazareth and announced his credentials. He, the Messiah, is here. This day, verse 21, this scripture is fulfilled in your ears. He's announcing to everyone's astonishment and amazement that the Messiah has come. Now, last week in our Bible study, we thought about Israel, the land and the people. The only piece of real estate on earth which has in Hebrew the sacred name of God in its title, Israel. And we thought about who owns the promised land. We thought about what's going on on the streets of Europe and the world. and What was happening in Amsterdam this last weekend as satanic evil Jew hatred, anti-Semitism exploded on the streets among the young football supporters of Israel. What is going on? And will it ever end? Will the Lord Jesus return? Friends, he will. Friends, he will. And he's not coming to a land called Palestine. He's coming to a land called Israel, the land where the Jewish people will have, are regathering now, and they will all have been, re, been regathered and, as they were when he came the first time. Now, this evening in our Bible study, I felt we should concentrate on a particular, beautiful introduction to the divine life of Christ. The day that he went into the synagogue, we read in uh, Luke chapter 4, and it was handed to him by the rabbi or the, the minister, the book. Not a book with pages as we use for a Bible that is known to scholars as a codex. No, he was handed a, a, a roll like this. You have to turn. And the minister or the rabbi gives him the word and he finds the place where it is written. The spirit of the Lord God is upon me. The Lord hath anointed me. And he announces, as I say, his messianic credentials. I want us to think about that uh, th this evening, the day when he went 
into the synagogue. All who sat upon him said, what gracious words proceeded out of his, out of his mouth. So the Lord Jesus prophesies, as, as I had said, instead of dry ground, his coming to the world would bring springs of water. Instead of heaviness, a garment of praise. These beautiful messianic expressions of the titles and offices of Christ. Instead of a thorn, the fig tree. Instead of a briar, the myrtle tree. And in a little uh, inclusion in Isaiah 61, I want to call your attention to a beautiful messianic expression. It says that the Lord Jesus, the coming Messiah, that Isaiah was preaching about, instead of ashes, he would give beauty. He would give beauty for ashes. In this beautiful expression, there is comfort for God's dear people today. I don't know most of you, some of you are friends of mine from the north of England here. I've been exiled in the north of England now for almost 40 years, but I get on with the northerners mostly. So, I come across sad people everywhere I go. People passing through and domestic loss. We've had a number of dear believers in this area who have passed away. I want, and they've gone to be with the Lord. I want to bring to tonight a message of encouragement. It's all about the Jewish Jesus. We studied beauty for ashes. Sometimes we are all sitting in ashes. The Hebrews knew all about this. And in the Old Testament, much is spoken of about ashes as an ancient symbol of deep personal grief or loss. There are many expressions or several in the Old Testament of people sitting in ashes. In our uh, semi-Christian uh, traditions here, there's Ash Wednesday. People do ashes on them. It's from the scripture, although not in the same way. It's a sign of grief. And there's a reference. This is Psalm 102. If you want to look it up sometime. Of people eating ashes. I wonder if there's someone today listening to this little preacher. And you're sitting in the ashes. You're not happy. The sorrow of loss. There are many causes. And the sorrow of sin. Hearts grieving for failure and letting the Lord down and sin and disappointment. Someone sitting today in the ashes. Here is a word from the Lord for you. The Lord Jesus is anointed to give you the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. He's anointed to give to you and me in our times of sadness. And we all go through them. I've been through times of deep sorrow, been through the waters of, of bereavement and loss, to lose the, my lovely wife. We, it's part of God's providential providence. And God is in the sunshine and the shadow. I think it was Spurgeon who said, nothing but sunshine makes a desert. And I guess that's true. Now, in the Hebrew Bible that we're reading just now, in Isaiah 61, the word ashes refers in the Hebrew language to sorrow and loss and unhappiness. Beauty, the word in the Hebrew Bible, is peer ephir, and it refers to a garland, a garland of flowers. You know, the Bible says weeping may endure for a night. We've all been through those nights. Not the nights long when we're weeping. Weeping may endure for a night, ah, but joy cometh in the morning. It isn't God's will that we live in the ashes and settle in the ashes. The psalmist said, yea, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I don't live there. I don't settle there. 
I've got to go through. Yea, though I walk through. I'm sure, as I enter those days of the shadow, I will come out the other end. If not in this world, then in the world to come. A lovely thought in the Hebrew tradition. When someone has lost someone they love, or some sadness has come, maybe sickness or loss, a little child in the family would be anointed. That's the word that, G that Jesus used. The Spirit of the Lord has anointed me. It means chosen, as the word Christ means chosen. A little child would be chosen from the family to go to the grieving, crestfallen, hurting believer and put a garland of flowers over the head and around the neck. What does this mean? It means don't stay in the ashes. Your sadness will come to an end. Weeping may endure for a night. You're passing through days of sadness. You have ashes on you. We, we thought about that a moment ago. The ashes they used to tell the family and others in the street, I'm passing through a time of sadness. Well, how wonderful that the Lord would give the, the, give beauty for ashes. Pier ephah, a tiara, a diadem, or a garland. And how wonderful that the Lord is able to do this for us, to give beauty at the right time in exchange for our ashes, our sorrow and our disappointment and our grief. As I thought, brothers and sisters, thank you for joining us. It's nice to be able to see you. I wish I could shake your hand. Unfortunately, we can't do that. But thank you for coming. As I thought about this, I thought, yes, my Savior, the Lord Jesus, is anointed. He's Messiah, means anointed one, Christos or Christ. He is anointed. No other can do it. God has anointed him to give, first of all, the beauty of salvation for the ashes of sin. I repeat, Jesus is the only man in the world who can give to me the beauty of his salvation for the ashes of sin, bad living, and wrong. And how wonderful that God is able to do that for us. The Lord Jesus Christ is the great lifter of our heads. The psalmist said, he's the, my glory and the lifter of my head. If, someone, if someone's listening to this little preacher this evening, your head's not lifted. You're passing through days when your head is down. We've all been there. We know what it's like, but it won't last. The Lord Jesus, perhaps even now, Today, this evening, will give you beauty for ashes. Psalm 113 and verse 7 says, He raiseth up the poor out of the dust and lifts the needy out of the dunghill, out of the mess, that he might set him among princes. What a wonderful transformation that Jesus can lift us out of the stench of a filth, of a life, out of the, the, the pit of manure and put us among princes. There's a lovely verse also in the book of Psalms that says that the Lord will beautify the meek with salvation. Please, will you let me repeat that verse? The Lord says, I will beautify the meek with salvation. That is, believers. The Lord Jesus will give us so wonderful beauty treatment. You can't get it on the NHS. It's a spiritual reality. He will give to us the beauty uh, to make us beautiful. And how wonderful the beauty of salvation. What a beauty treatment. The Lord will, he will, I will beautify the meek with salvation. Brothers and sisters, what salvation does for men and women. What salvation would do for Britain, my sad, tragic, violent, confronting nation, everyone against everyone. What a sad state my country is in, all because of sin. 
sometimes I watch the news and I think, Lord, I never dreamt I'd live in a country like this. This is not my country. How did we get here so quickly? I remember as a child, I could go out to play, leave the front door open, nobody would touch it. It was a better land, but we've become a land defaced and made ugly by sin. But salvation would beautify my nation and the people of my nation and the children and the teenagers and the young people of my nation. Salvation ennobles and lifts. And here the Lord Jesus says, I am anointed of the Father to give beauty for ashes. Sin is miserable. Sin is demeaning. Sin is dehumanizing. But Jesus Christ will lift us. You know the lovely hymn, Don't Worry, I Won't Sing It For You. Do you remember it? What a wonderful change in my life has been, Lord, since Jesus came into my heart. Yes, he comes to change, to beautify, to give beauty of salvation for the ashes of sin and wrong living and bad days. As I thought about this text this evening, that he is anointed to give beauty for ashes, I thought, yes, here's another wonderful thing the Lord is anointed to give. Not only the beauty of forgiveness for the ashes of guilt and sin, but the Lord Jesus is anointed in the future, listen, friends, to give the beauty of the resurrection body for the ashes of this aging and corrupting one. We all live in a body that's corrupting. I'm an old man now, and uh, I'm getting old. I was saying to my two dear children, I'm so thankful for them. They live not far from me. And I have six grandchildren as well. I was saying to them, I spent a good many years of my younger life telling you what you could do and what you shouldn't do, and where you could go and where you mustn't go. And now life's turned around and you're telling me where I have to go, what I'm not to do. Daddy, you're not going there, are you? They love me. that They don't want me to travel so much. Daddy, you're not going down to London again, are you? And I have to say to them quietly, now look, I get my orders from the boss. But thank you for your concern. Well, how wonderful that one day this aging body of mine it's uh, getting older every day I'm reminded. I can't do what I used to do. I'm still running, but, but not as fast as I could run. I used to run years ago. I wish to point you to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. What a wonderful chapter is 1 Corinthians 15. When you get discouraged, turn to 1 Corinthians 15. The great resurrection chapter. The great chapter of Resurrection triumph. Christians are going to win in the end, no matter what happens, even if I die. Well, Jesus can raise the dead. You see, we cannot lose if we put our full trust in Christ. So I repeat, number two, Jesus Christ is anointed of the Father. No one else can do it to give the beauty of the resurrection body that is at the rapture. In the near future, it can't be far off for the mortal aging body in which I live. The 1 Corinthians 15 from verse uh, 42, I'm going to read. I, I hope very much that you'll listen. There is verse 41. There is one glory of the sun and another glory of the moon and another glory of the stars. For one star differeth from another star in glory. So also is the resurrection of the dead. Here it is. The dead are sown in corruption. But it is raised in incorruption. It is sown and in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. We thought of this when my dear wife was the last few hours of her life. We were there when she passed over. And her body was so weak. It is sown in weakness. 
it is raised in power. So the body is sown in the ground. It's not, not the end. When we die, we don't go to a grave. That would be the end. We go to a bed. Our bodies are sown in the ground, awaiting the resurrection. Great morning at the rapture, when the dead in Christ will rise first. We'll read it in a second or two. The difference between the believers being sown and, and, and a grave is, is very big. You see, a bed is something, and the, the Bible speaks of believers as sleeping. The soul doesn't sleep. It's the soul that sleeps. But sleep means that I can be awakened at any time. And praise God for the day when the dead will awake and rise from the dead. Verse 44, 1 Corinthians 15, it is sown a natural body. Yes. It is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body and a spiritual body. And then down, please, to verse 49, 1 Corinthians 15. And as we have borne the image of the earthy, uh, we don't know what this means, do we? But just look in the mirror. <laughs> we have borne the image of the earthy. We look fine when we're young. Ah, but as a flower of the field, so we flourish. <laughs> and one day, our aging bodies will let us down. As we have borne the image of the earth, earthy, that is this uh, aging, corrupting body, we shall bear the image of the heavenly. One day we're going to get another, a new body, an everlasting body, a body like the Lord Jesus, who the scripture speaks of as the first fruits of those who sleep, his guarantee, his resurrection guaranteed I and yours if you're a believer you're going to live forever just as he does now this I say unto you verse 50 flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God neither doth corruption inherit incorruption I cannot live eternally in this body it's it's aging it's it's co co corrupt corrupting one day, one day I'm going to get a beautiful new body which will last for all eternity, and I can live forever with Christ. Behold, I show unto you a mystery, that is a truth that was not disclosed to the saints in former times. We shall not all sleep, not all going to die, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet or shofar, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible. And we, oh, so Paul was not expecting to die. He thought the Lord would come before he passed. I think later on in some of his epistles, he understood that he would live longer into the future. This corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. You see, the Lord Jesus Christ is going to raise the dead. It'll happen in the twinkling of an eye. It will happen at what we call the rapture. What a day that will be. The word rapture isn't in the Bible, but the word parpazo is. And it means to be snatched suddenly from one place to another place. <clears throat> one day the Lord will come to take us home and to give us a beautiful <clears throat> new body that will be changed to be like Excuse me, like his lovely body. The Lord Jesus in the temple that day opened the scroll of the scripture and he announced with divine authority and pathos, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me. He has anointed me. And he went down that wonderful list of beautiful benefits for the saints. And then he said, and I'm anointed to give beauty in exchange for ashes. The beauty of his salvation for the ashes of my disobedience, foolishness and sin. The beauty of the resurrection body for the ashes of this corrupting one. Every time I conduct a funeral, I have to say ashes to ashes, dust to dust. Yes, that's where we came from. That's where the body returns. One day he's going to give me a brand new body. So brothers and sisters listening to your preacher this evening, if you've got a lot of pains and aches and joints, 
that are troubling you. You've got a lot of aches and pains. Make the most of them now. When the Lord comes, you won't have them at all. But I have a last point. Thank you for listening. Not only is the Lord Jesus anointed to give the beauty of his salvation for the ashes of my sinful life, not only is the Lord Jesus anointed by the Father to give the beauty of the resurrection body one day, perhaps soon, for the ashes of this aging and corruptible one that uh, reminds me every day that I'm not going to live here forever. One day I'm going to inherit eternity. But I want to say before I finish, Jesus Christ, Yeshua, the Jewish Savior we thought about last winter, the Spirit of the Lord is upon him to give the beauty of the Christ life for the ashes of the self life. And I refer you to Galatians chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2 and at verse 20. I hope some of you maybe will be looking up this in, in your Bibles. Galatians 2 and verse 20. I am crucified with Christ. Here the apostle teaches the church the secret, not of justification, that's already taken place, but sanctification. Two great works of grace God wants to complete in you and me. The first one is justification. When I'm saved, it happens once. And I'm saved forever. But sanctification is something that goes on. It's a process that lasts all my life. Justification is something Christ does for me. Justification, a sanctification is something God does in me. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I know that many of you listening to my voice could quote that off by heart. No longer I, but Christ. No more me, but Jesus. Here is the wonder of the believer's sanctification. Something that begins when we trust the Lord for a clean heart and a renewed vision when we yield our all to the Lord. I, he says, I am crucified with Christ. You have read this before. Would you agree with your speaker this evening? Perhaps the biggest problem in my life is I, me. One of the great preachers said, I have more, uh, it was uh, Spurgeon. He said, I have more trouble with Charles Spurgeon than any other, any other man I know. Yes, the I life in us that wants to rule, that resists the control of the Holy Spirit. I am crucified with Christ. And someone pointed out, and I share with you, dear friends, what is the cross? The cross is a large capital I crossed out. A large capital I with the cross beam crossing it out. No longer my life under the control of I, me, ego. But that's crossed out. And I have the freedom to live day by day in the joy of full salvation. On the beautiful island of Sardinia, which I know you will know is Italy, the island of Sardinia, there lived a few years back a man called Mario Mameli. Why, he would be an Italian, all right, with a name like that. Mario Mameli needed a new ID card. Um, Italy is a so socialist country. You have to carry with you personal ID. And he had lost his ID card. So he went to his city hall, the city where he lived, to get a new identity card. He went to the desk and 
saw the city official there and he said, this is my name and here's where I live and uh, I need a new ID card. The official disappeared and then he came back <laughs> and announced to Mario Mameli, I don't understand this because according to our official records, you've been dead for 19 years. What? According to our official civic records, you don't, you've been dead for, for 19 years. The poor Italian was further mystified to be informed that he was breaking the law by being alive. <laughs> well, we smile at this that happened to a man. But friends, listen to me. Listen to this. Do you know that you and I have been officially dead since we were ever born again? The only right we have to live is the life that Christ offers us, the life Paul speaks of as, yet not I, but Christ. That's the only life we have a mandate to live. We, we don't have to live for self, pride, ego, a life ruled by self-will. But the work of sanctification, full consecration, means that we can live free for the Lord. Colossians chapter 3 verse 3 says, Ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. Here is the doctrine of costly co-crucifixion of the believer with Christ. We can lay down our lives and yield our lives over to be to be dead. Give them up to the cross. Ye are dead. It means you died and your life is hid with Christ in God. Would you agree with your speaker this evening? I too have not lived perfectly for Christ. I don't think any Christian ever has. None of us follow Christ perfectly. That doesn't mean that oh, we must be against the Lord. His great work of sanctification. Paul writes in Thessalonians chapter 1 verse 4, The very God of peace sanctify you wholly, utterly. And I pray God your whole spirit, soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of the Lord. What a salvation is this, brothers and sisters, your whole spirit, soul, and body. So there the Bible teaches me that I am tripartite. I am a spirit, yes, and a soul, yes, and a body. And the grace and the power of the Holy Spirit can bring everything under the sweet control of the Lord. Would you agree with your speaker tonight when I say that sometimes there are Christians we meet who have been to the cross. They're, they're saved, justified, but they have never got on the cross. Many who want the Lord Jesus to save them, oh, I want to go to heaven when I die. But we don't want Christ to be the master of our ambitions. Give my future, my choice of life partner, my work, my future, my business, my money, I don't want Jesus Christ to control all that. Yes, that's where the doctrine of sanctification comes in. I have uh, spoken with Christians, and sometimes I've been the same, who have too much of self to enjoy Christ and too much of Christ to enjoy self. Ellie Maxwell, Ellie Maxwell was a, Wonderful Bible teacher, he founded the Prairie Bible Institute, Three Hills, Alberta, Canada. What a marvelous Bible school that was, known all over the world. In his book, Crucified with Christ, he writes, Breathe your last, O fellow believer, let Christ take over. He is a great undertaker for those who pass out. Isn't that wonderful? Do you mind if I quote it again? Breathe your last, O believer. Breathe your last. Die to self. Breathe your last. Let Christ take over. He is a great undertaker for those who pass out. Maybe uh, most 
right? In the company of the church. We need to go to a, a funeral. Whose funeral? Why? My funeral. Your funeral. We need to learn again the life of costly, yes, co-crucifixion with Christ. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. I'm an apostle and I'm preaching every Sunday. Yet not I. It's no more longer. My life's not, no longer mastered by me. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. May God help us into that great life of crucifixion with Christ. Thank you so much for listening. Tonight there's a challenge for us to be the best for Christ. Not to give the Lord Jesus bits of our lives, uh, especially the bits that won't cost me much, but to give my all to Christ. Like the old hymn, beloved, I'm sure by you and by me, ever since I was saved as a boy of 14. The lovely words of the hymn, love so amazing, so divine demands my life, my soul, yes, and my all. May we do that even tonight if we haven't done it in recent days. The trouble is we go off the boil, don't we? We know the joy of full commitment to Christ, and then we call. Well, what a wonderful time, even tonight, before we sleep. Go to the bedroom and kneel and say, Lord Jesus, I I want to be fully dying. I don't want to be partly saved. I want to be fully saved. And I want to know this great, deep work of sanctification. I want you, Lord, to make me holy. And more like your son. Thank you for listening. I hope these simple thoughts have helped you and encouraged you. And we're going to finish now with prayer. And I invite you to bow your head wherever you are in your bedroom, in the front room. Uh, some of you up there in Bonnie, Scotland. Uh, I keep saying Bonnie, Scotland because I love Scotland. My grandfather came from Gurrock up on the Clyde. And he used to say to me, Son, Alec, I'm a Scot, so you've got a wee bit, wee bit of good blood in you. <laughs> well, I've got the life of Christ in me. That's even better. Will you bow in prayer with me? Lord Jesus Christ, grow thou in me, and all things else receive. My heart be daily nearer thee, from sin be daily free. Lord, we make that our prayer in closing. Thank you for each other. Thank you for the fellowship. Thank you for the dear brother, Brother John, who arranges so many things and others who help. We give thanks for our fellowship around the open Bible this evening. Lord Jesus, take us, take me, and make us wholly thine. For thy glory, for our eternal good.